There were two uh, quotes uh, from scripture that I wanted to begin with. And a lot of times when I uh, talk to a group like this, it's not a straight lecture, so there'll be some um, give and take and questions, you know, that uh, if, if you, I might have for you, then you might have for me, right? But the first quote is from uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 16 where he says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Now that word sharing in the Greek is koinonia, or communio, fellowship, if you want. And the second quote is from the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 14. And it is this. The blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, will purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. And if you remember those quotes, they'll somehow be woven into the theme of what we're doing tonight. It was Cardinal Avery Dulles who said that the church's teaching on the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist takes the human mind to the limits of its capacity. In the end, the Cardinal said, we have to acknowledge that we're dealing with a mystery that is ineffable and that it should be therefore greeted with wonder and encouragement. And we sort of acknowledge this at every Mass, don't we? When after the consecration, the priest proclaims, at least in the Latin, Mysterium Fidei. How do we say it in English? Let us acknowledge, what do we say? I forget. As often as I've said it in English, I forget if I don't have the book. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. But it's mysterium fidei, we, they say. So it's like Mary, we are invited to ponder all the mysteries of her son's life in our hearts. Remember in chapter 6 of John's Gospel? Well, that, go that gospel in chapter 6, together with the institution narratives in the synoptics and Paul, are the scriptural basis of the church's teaching on the real presence as a matter of faith. In Jesus' controversy with the Jews in chapter 6, we hear Jesus say clearly, my flesh is real food and my blood real drink. The man who feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Jesus was not using metaphors. And when some of his followers found his statement too difficult, they left his company. But notice that Jesus did not modify his teachings to win them back. I always remember, just as an aside, Chesterton once said, it's not a good thing for the church to get too chummy with the government. It's good for the government, he says, but it's not good for the church. Because the church then starts to water down its teaching in order to accommodate itself to what the government wants to do, especially in terms of its philosophy and the money that it would give. John is probably well aware of that in the hospital, uh, thing like that. But Jesus does not, he does not ever water down his teaching. Now, where do we find the church's dogmatic teaching? But we find it in the Council of Trent. And the teaching in Trent is given a full exposition. And that teaching still remains today as normative as ever. Now, the Trent uses three adverbs, truly, really, and substantially to tell us how Christ is present in the Eucharist. Truly, really, and substantially. I just want to give a brief word on each of those, right? Christ is truly contained under the Eucharistic species. 
Now, one of those handouts that you got, you have the Adorote. All right. I'll, I'll go over this a little bit more at the, uh, at the end. I'm going to go over some of these hymns. But in the, uh, th that idea that, uh, that he is contained truly under the Eucharistic species is brought out in that first paragraph. Uh, just to give you a, a, a quick uh, translation, uh, the adoro te devote latens deitas, I adore you devotedly, hidden deity, all right? Who, que sub his figuris vere latitas, who under these species is truly hidden, all right? That's, that's the line. We'll go off with the rest of it uh, a little later. But that, that's captured very well. We don't know who wrote that hymn. Most people attribute it to Thomas Aquinas, but we're not sure. But whoever did it captured it beautifully in, in the Latin. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful hymn, right? So truly present means that the sacrament is not a mere sign or a figure pointing away from itself to a body that is absent. He's truly present, right? Now, really, he's really present in the Eucharistic species. This presence is ontological. It's objective. It takes place in the order of being and does not depend on the thoughts or feelings of the priest or of those who receive communion. It is not faith that brings about Christ's presence in the Eucharist. Faith acknowledges the presence that is brought about through the power of the Holy Spirit and the words of the priest who properly celebrates the Mass with the proper matter and form. And then the third adverb, substantially. Christ is substantially present. Substance here denotes the basic reality of a thing, what something is in itself. Uh, the, the Latin is substare, what stands under the appearances. Now we all know that appearances can shift from one moment to the next while leaving the subject intact. And when Cardinal Dulles was discuss discussing this, he said a person can put on a disguise or become seriously ill, but such a person does not cease to be the person they are. The substance of the person is unchanged. Christ is present in all the sacraments by his dynamic power, but in the Eucharist, his presence is in addition substantial. That distinction between dynamically present and substantially present, Christ is present in the sacrament of baptism, sacrament of confirmation, sacrament of penance, all of the sacraments, but not substantially. He's substantially present in the Eucharist. Right? So Trent teaches that the whole substance of the bread and wine become the substance of the body and blood of Christ. And because Christ cannot be divided, the body and blood also become his soul and divinity. The whole Christ is made present under each of the two species. Now the church uses the term transubstantiation to designate the process by which the whole substance of the bread and wine and only the substance is changed into the substance of Christ's body and blood. So the presence of Christ is spiritual or sacramental not physical in the sense of measurable, not in the way bodies are in place. For instance, looking at the host or the precious blood, we cannot say that the head is here and the feet there. Christ's presence in the Eucharist can be likened to that of the soul in the body. Our souls are not partly in our heads and partly in our hearts, partly in our hands, the soul is entirely present in the whole and in every part. So when the host is broken, 
Each fragment, the church teaches, contains Christ as fully as did the whole. A single drop of blood contains as much of Christ as the whole chalice. And you will see, uh, I have uh, the, the uh, little Latin here in the, uh, in the uh, one, two, three, four, five. The uh, sixth verse down in the Adorote. You say it begins with P.A. Pelicane. P.A. Pelicane is, uh, Pius is a difficult word to translate into English. If you know Virgil, you know Pius Aeneas, uh, faithful Aeneas. But you might say compassionate, something like that. But he's comparing Christ to the pelican, who, according to tradition, will puncture the chest to feed the young with its blood. Uh, but pie pelicane Jesu domine. Uh, me immundum munda tu. Cure me with your blood, who is unclean. But then he, he adds this, see. Cuius una stilla salvum facere totum mundum quit ab omni celere. One drop of whose blood, one drop of whose blood can save the world from all its sin. Again, a, a beautiful, terse little saying in the Latin that it's, you'd have to expand it more in, in the English. Right? Now, I want to talk a little bit about the Eucharist in Calvary. It was in 1562 that the Council of Trent addressed this whole issue in its 22nd session, which is dedicated to the explanation of the sacrifice of the Mass. And the Council taught that the bloody sacrifice of Christ offered once for all on the altar of the cross is represented in an unbloody manner, but not repeated under the visible signs to celebrate the meaning of Christ's passage from this world and to apply the salutary power of his sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. So it's not repeated because the cross is once for all. It's represented. All right? The Council could not recognize the Mass as sacrificial and salvific without linking it to the once and for all historical sacrifice of Christ on Calvary. I hope you're familiar a little bit with Cardinal Ratzinger's book on the spirit of the liturgy. Has anybody here read the spirit of the liturgy? Some have. Okay, good. Well, in that book, he teaches that there are three levels on which Christian worship operates. The first level is the Last Supper, including the cross and resurrection. The second level is the liturgical level. And the third level, he talks about it, but he doesn't give it this name. I give it the name of contemporaneity. And I'll explain all of these to you. He points out that the, the, the liturgical level does not stand on its own. And that's what Trent was teaching. It has meaning only in relation to something that really happened, to a reality that is substantially present. Otherwise, he says, it would lack real content, like a banknote without funds to cover them. The Lord could say that his body was given he says it, we say at Mass, only because he had in fact given it. So in the liturgical, it's connected to the Calvary. Right? He could present his blood in the new chalice as shed for many, Cardinal says, only because he had really shed it. Without the cross resurrection, Christian worship is null and void. The cross resurrection are the historical events that happened just once and as such belong to the past. 
This is the, 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 uh, the Latin word is semel. Uh, it, it, it appears especially in the epistle to the Hebrews in chapter 7, chapter 9, and chapter 10 where the author, author uses the word epaphox, once for all, is what the meaning is. Once for all, right? Uh, so that's when it was done once for all, but it's represented in the Mass. But the Mass would have no meaning at all unless that had already happened. Right? So there's that connection. Now, the third level that Cardinal Ratzinger talks about is what I call contemporaneity. And obviously that deals with what the Eucharist has to do with us today. Those of you who have read the book, we remember that Cardinal Ratzinger began his study with three questions. What is the liturgy? What happens during the liturgy? And what kind of reality do we encounter there? Now, I've gone through that uh, book with my parishioners, and it's funny, and with several priests as well at another, uh, at another time. If you were to ask people, why do you go to church on Sunday? What do you think they would say? Because you have to. <laughs> right. Right? Does anybody else have another reason why would one go to church on Sunday? I mean, why, in other words, he's asking, the, he's asking some very, a very profound question. Why are you here at the liturgy? What, what, what do you think is taking place here? Right? Now, he answers the question. It's, I think it's very profound. He says, we come to take part in the liturgy so that our wounded freedom may be healed. You should write that on your mirror. <laughs> we come to Mass so that our wounded freedom may be healed. We come so that by participating in this liturgy, our estrangement from God may be healed. It was St. Bernard who taught that the once for all bears with it the always, the perpetual. And what is perpetual takes place in what happened only once. But it's that coming together to have our wounded freedom healed, to have our estrangement from God healed. That's why we're there. Now, I think that's a good thing to remember so that you wouldn't have to say anymore that the only reason you go to Mass is because you have to. That's why people should want to go to have their wounded freedom healed. Right? Right? In the Christian liturgy, we not only receive something from the past, but we become contemporaries with what lies at the foundation of that liturgy. In the, litur in the Eucharist, we are caught up and made contemporary with the Paschal mystery of Christ. So the liturgy should have a shaping influence on us who participate in it. One of the things we always have to remember is this. We have to recall that Christ's exterior act of being crucified was accompanied by an interior act of self-giving. That's the body given for you, the blood poured out for you. So that exterior, interior act took place in time but the cardinal would say, it transcends time. And since it comes from time, time can again and again be brought into it. That's how we become contemporary with the past events of our salvation. 
So the celebration of the Eucharist is not just a rite, not just a liturgical game. It is meant to make Christ's self-giving love to become mine. The liturgy then has a bearing on my everyday life, on my personal experience. Its aim is that our bodies become a living sacrifice united with the sacrifice of Christ. A, a, a very important uh, passage. My Bible is kind of falling apart. Good. Yes. It's, is uh, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says this, and now brothers, I beg you through the mercy of God to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, your spiritual worship. Right? Now, that idea of your spiritual worship, Cardinal Ratzinger, I think waxes eloquent on that. And notice it's a living sacrifice. It's not the sacrifice of dead animals. Your living sacrifice. All right. And he calls it your spiritual worship. If, if you conform your body to the body of Christ, and you make what he did in his self-giving love part of your daily life, that's your spiritual worship. Uh, it's a funny Greek expression it's a, a, a logikon letrian. Uh, it's, 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 like, it's almost like it's, it's a logical worship. The, the, the logikon, the logos, you can see reason in there. It, it might be what might be reasonably expected as a return to God for the mercy he has shown us. That's what the living sacrifice should be. But that's, what we're, that's why we're there. You know, I always get a kick out of the younger people, they don't want to go to church. They don't know what's going on there. Uh, but that's why they have to remember all those things. Healing the wounded freedom. Estrangement from God is healed. Make, you make yourself contemporary with the sacrifice of Christ, whose internal self-giving was brought forth and manifested in the external act of crucifixion. That becomes your living sacrifice, which is a reasonable expectation on the part of God so that his love is not unrequited. At this third stage is Christ's desire to take hold of every worshiper's life and ultimately of all historical reality. And that's why we unite ourselves with the great men who offered sacrifice do any of you, when you go to church on Sunday, do you, does the priest ever use Eucharistic prayer one? They do? Good. Most of them rush through two. <laughs> or even three. The Eucharistic prayer one. But in that, we do, we do unite ourselves with those uh, great men who offered sacrifice, Abel, Melchizedek, Abraham. So the aim of the liturgy is to give glory to God and that our bodies become that living sacrifice. Cardinal Ratzinger quotes St. Augustine, who said that the true worship is love transformed mankind. Love transformed mankind. And then he quotes also the famous saying of St. Irenaeus, the glory of God is the living man but the life of man is the vision of God. Right? You often hear the first part, but you never always hear the second part of that quote from Aeneas. Now, continuing on that contemporaneity thing, I'm going to talk about the role of the spirit. The question we have to ask is, how do I make my body, my life, a living sacrifice of praise. How do I appropriate in my life what Jesus did for me in bringing about my salvation? How do we do it? Well, we say, yes, the, the grace of God, the Father. That's true. 
But we have to pay attention to and meditate on the profoundly connected roles of the incarnate risen Christ and the Holy Spirit. Our theology always speaks of the missions of the Son and the Holy Spirit. The trinity of persons were involved in the creation of the world and they're also involved in the new creation that came about in the incarnation of the Son. The New Testament gives witness to the role of the Holy Spirit in the incarnation and the public ministry of Jesus. Mary conceived the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit descended upon Jesus at the baptism. The Spirit, we sometimes say led, but it's in Mark, it's the Spirit propelled Jesus into the desert. Jesus, according to John, handed over the Spirit to his mother and the beloved disciple on the cross. And on Pentecost, the Spirit came upon those gathered in the upper room. St. Paul ends the second epistle to the Corinthians with the words we use in our greeting at Mass. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And you're supposed to say, and also with your spirit. Do we say that though? And also with you, we say. Well, the new translation is going to say, and with your spirit. Which will be the old translation. Which be the old, which was the old, which was the Latin, right? It's Second Corinthians, chapter, at the very end, chapter thirteen. Uh, and of course, we begin every Eucharist, as John began the session tonight, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's a reason we do that because the Trinity is involved. Right. Now, the liturgy of readings, of course, the, that part which is very, very important, is followed by the offertory prayers or the anaphora, which is, means to, to lift up, to bear up. The anamnesis, which is the re remembering, right? And the epiclesis, or the coming down, right? This epiclesis is the prayer asking the Holy Spirit to descend upon the bread and wine and change them into the body and blood of Christ for the spiritual profit of those who receive them. For instance, in Eucharistic prayer three, we say, and so Father, we bring you these gifts. We ask you to make them holy by the power of your spirit that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's calling down the Spirit on the gifts. It's through the power of the Spirit that this happens. Right? In Eucharistic prayer 2, we say, let your Spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy. The, the, the Latin is heic erga dona quesimus, spiritus tui rore santifica. The rore, it's a beautiful expression here. Let your spirit, my translation is, let your spirit drop down like dew and make these gifts holy. Right. What's interesting to note, those of you who are familiar with Eucharistic prayer one, is that there is no epiclesis. We don't call the spirit down. And the thing you might say, well, why is that, I wonder? But we ask, the, 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 uh, in the Latin, it's clementissime pater, most merciful father. Right? And we ask this most merciful father to accept and bless these gifts, heic dona, heic munora, heic sancta sacrificia illibata. However, after the consecration, right before the commemoration of the dead, the priest asks God to command his old holy angel to take 
to your altar in heaven the gifts that we have here on this altar, namely the body and blood of Christ, so that partaking in it, we may be filled with every grace and blessing. So it's said of a, an ascend, or a descending order in the Epiclesis, we have an ascending order right, of the consecrated species to the heavenly altar through the hands of God's holy angel. It's just interesting to note those different things. Right? Now, <clears throat> many will point out that in addition to the Epiclesis before the consecration, there is also one after the words of institution. When, for instance, in Eucharistic prayer two, the priest prays that all those who share the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit, a spiritu sancto congregemur in unum, that we all brought together in one. In prayer three, it is that all who are nourished by the body and blood may be filled with his Holy Spirit and become one body, one spirit in Christ. That's the communio, the koinonia. And it's that that is described in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 42. Remember, that was when the Holy Spirit came down upon those in the upper room, and they started to live a new life consisting in devotion to the teaching of the apostles, fellowship or koinonia, breaking of the bread and prayer. So it's through the Holy Spirit that we experience here and now the impact of the salvation brought about through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And it is that same Spirit who imparts a whole range of gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. In the famous passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 13, you have all those gifts of the Spirit. And I think we're always aware of the role of the Spirit or the role of the Trinity in the Mass when we are there, but how we are supposed to appropriate all this. We do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Cardinal Ratzinger sees the fellowship as a specific gift of the Spirit, the fruit of the love given by the Father and the grace offered by Jesus. Uh, the koinonia of the Holy Spirit, he says, guides us <coughs> to perceiving our participation in the divine life, each one individually, but also the communion among believers that the Spirit kindles as builder and principal agent, building up the body of Christ. In our Mass, the anamnesis of the Son we remember, anamnesis is really remembering, and the epiclesis of the Spirit have their inseparable but distinct place in leading to the doxology where we give glory to God the Father, you know, through Him, with Him, in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory to you, to the Father. So you have the Son, the Spirit, and the Father. But to see the connection, I don't know that we ever see that doxology at the end uh, as uh, connected to the descent of the Spirit, the, uh, the, the sacrifice of Christ, and the giving glory to the Father in the end. So it's that doxology that completes the Eucharistic prayer by directing all glory and honor to God the Father through, with, and in Christ in the unity affected by the Holy Spirit. So the Mass then involves a Trinitarian anamnesis, epiclesis, doxology, a remembering the scent of the Holy Spirit and giving glory to God the Father. And as Father Jerry Collins has pointed out in many of his books, any reflection on the death and resurrection of Jesus, which fails to attend to the Father and the Holy Spirit, remains theologically impoverished. It's very important to see that whole Trinitarian involvement. 
So all that being said about what the mass is and what Ratzinger is saying is the uh, healing our wounded freedom, our estrangement with God, uh, bridged. We can understand Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 following, when he says, every time then you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. So that proclaiming the death of the Lord till he comes. You ever notice in the uh, in Eucharistic prayer one, uh, right after the consecration, we remember his death, resurrection, and his ascension. The ascension, the recalling of the ascension becomes very, very important. Because the ascension reveals our movement, our destiny, an existence that we have through sharing in the life of the Trinity. The, the ascension recalls our movement into the life of God made possible by the death resurrection of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's a movement that will be completed when all members of the body are drawn up in the Father and share the life with the Trinity. So there is a, um, uh, a future element that's brought out just by that recalling of the ascension. Now, in, in one of those other uh, papers that I gave you, wait, you see the one that's a, it's a brief little one, it says, O Sacrum Convivium. O Sacrum Convivium. O Sacred Banquet. In quote, Christus Sumitur, in which Christ is consumed. And what else happens? The memory of his passion is recalled. Recall it to our memoria passioni sayers. The memory of his passion is recalled. Mens in plato gratia, the, the mind or our being is filled with grace. And a, opinion, a token of our future glory is given to us. At future glory, nobis pinius dator. And those six little lines, the whole theology is captured. The remembering, right, the passion, the grace that we get, and the future glory. Right. Continuing on Paul's uh, treatment there, it, it, he, he says this. This means that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily sins against the body and blood of the Lord. And he goes on to say, a man should examine himself first. Only then should he eat of the bread and drink the cup. Such a one drinks a judgment on himself. I want to refer you to something in chapter 5 of Matthew's uh, Gospel. It's part of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And it's a, uh, where Jesus is teaching about anger. Remember he said, you have heard the commandment imposed on your forefathers. You shall not commit murder. Every murderer shall be liable to judgment. What I say to you is, everyone who grows angry with his brother shall be liable to the judgment. Anyone who uses abusive language toward his brother shall be answerable to the Sanhedrin. And if he holds his brother in contempt, he risks the fire of Gehenna. I think key here is this. If you bring your gift to the altar, and there recall that your brother has anything against you, leave your gift at the altar, go first to be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. What do you think of that saying? If you have anger, anger is equivalent to murder. And if you use abusive language, what are you doing if you get angry with your brother or sister, what is it you're doing? What are you destroying? 
Yeah, what, what, what's the word we've been using? Yeah, well, you're, what is it? Yes, you're destroying the communion, the communion. You're destroying the kononia, the fellowship, when you get angry. So what he's saying is, if, if, you, if you, you, you come to church, now I, I give a kind of tough interpretation of this. If you come to church, and you cannot give the kiss of peace, and you're bringing your gift, namely yourself, your living sacrifice of praise, if you're bringing that to the altar, and you remember your brother has something against you, he says, go first to be reconciled with your brother. Then offer your gift. Now how many times does it happen that people are in church and you might be standing by someone that you hate? And they won't have anything to do with you. You know, and if you extend your hand in fellowship, in koinonia, they might turn the other way, pretend they don't notice. Right? It's serious business. It's serious business when you're dealing with the Eucharist, right? It, it, it is not by accident that the gospel accounts of the institution of the Eucharist are sandwiched between predictions of radical discipleship failure. Right? You notice that when you read the gospels, but you'll see it on Sunday. You hear the passion of Matthew. And the radical discipleship failure we're talking about is the betrayal of Judas and the denial of Peter. The evangelists place before us the sobering thought that the possibility of betrayal is a real one, even for the best of us, even one of the twelve. So the prediction surrounding this ultimate act of love creates a tension between the bread broken for us and the bond broken by us. So participation in the Eucharist is not over when the priest says, we used to say, itate misa es, go, the mass is ended, go in peace. What, what do you think that word means there, go in peace? In what way? Loving your neighbor. Good. Peace is a synonym for kononia. <coughs> the, the Greek word for um, peace is irene. Do we have any irenes here? Irene. Koine. Remember, the Pope, when he usually uh, writes to, a, a, to the universal church, he'll write to all those in peace and communion with the Holy See. Peace and communion are the same thing. So the, the kiss of peace is a kiss of, kiss of is a, a fellowship. Go in peace, right? Uh, someone dies in peace. What do you think that means? Someone so had a peaceful death. What does that mean to us today? No pain. But th think, think, what is it? Reconciling. Okay, good. Because the, uh, the idea is, when, when, the, when the early Christians put R.I.P. on a grave, they meant to mark that out as a grave of someone who died as a member of the believing community. The, the, the peace, the in pace, requiescat, requievit in pace, is, he died in peace, namely as a member of the community. If it was a subjunctive, requiescat, they are hoping that he died as a member of the community, right? But that, that's what that is. You know, it's, 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 it's a use of words all the time that we hear at Mass, but we're not really full, uh, we don't capture the full meaning of them. Right? I want to say a word, if I could, about the popular um, configuration of the altar. Is it versus populum or ad orientem? Right? When we did pray ad orientem to the east, right, the, the, uh, the priest's uh, 
And, and as, as people point out, that, that, that's still possible today, even with the Paul VI uh, ordo. The priest doesn't have to stand facing the people, but he can face the other way. But p p put this in your mind as this. Picture the altar as a threshold. On one side, the faithful stand with all their fragility and human weakness, acknowledging that they are sinful servants. Like them, in his human weakness, stands the priest facing the altar. But beyond the altar, above the altar, stands our Heavenly Father in all his holiness, a mysterium tremens et fascinans, a tremens, a, a frightening and fascinating mystery. For most of the Eucharistic prayer, the priest asks the Father to remember what his Son has done for us. And the priest also assures the Father that we remember what Jesus has done for us. We're praying to the Father, remember. We're all saying, but we remember too. Right? And if the Father remembers what his Son has done for us, he will surely be merciful for us sinners, just as he was merciful to his people Israel when they, in prayer, asked him to remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're always asking God to remember. Because as long as he remembers, he's going to be merciful. So we say, look not on our sins, the priest says this, but on the faith of your church. That is, we're saying, remember the faith of all those who have preceded us. People like Mary, the apostles, the martyrs, the confessors, the doctors, the canonized and uncanonized saints. Remembering them, the Father will surely be a loving Father to us. So what I'm getting at here is the priest stands at the altar as an advocate of the people. He's the lawyer. And with his humility, he prays and makes petition to the most merciful Father. And, and, and that's in the, in the first Eucharistic prayer in the Latin, Te Igi Tor Clementissime Pater, you most holy Father, that he, through Jesus Christ, his Son and our Lord, will bless and accept these gifts, these offerings, this holy, unblemished sacrifice. And again, to the Epiclesis, the priest extends his hands over the bread and wine and asks the Father to graciously accept the offering of his, namely the priest's own ministry and that of the whole family of believers and to bestow peace on us, free us from eternal damnation and count us among the elect. Right. Now, once he says that, an amazing transformation takes place. When the priest utters the words of institution, he no longer speaks as an advocate. Now he speaks with the eye of Christ. Notice he doesn't say, this, tell me the Father to remember, he doesn't say, this is his body. Instead, he says, this is my body. He doesn't say, this is his cup of blood. This is my cup of blood. But to speak with the eye of Christ, the priest has to grasp and live each day with the reality that is taking place. To speak with the eye of Christ, the priest must have that inner readiness and that calm reflection that should be evident in the profound reverence with which he celebrates the Eucharist. 
The priest, above all, has to realize that his participation in the Eucharist is not over with the Ite Misa Est. Cardinal Ratzinger gave a keynote address at St. Charles Seminary when he established the John Cardinal Kroll Chair of Moral Theology. Our beloved John was the first occupant of that chair. And at, that, uh, at his keynote address, Ratzinger said this to priests, a sobering reminder, especially in these our days. He said this, whoever exposes himself to the radioactive ray of God's word, indeed whoever handles it as his vocation, must be prepared to live close to such a presence, else he will be burned. He goes on, he says, one can see how the real danger is, for it is probable that all the great crises in the church were essentially connected to a decline in the clergy for whom intercourse with the holy has ceased to be the fascinating and perilous mystery it is of coming close to the presence of the all holy one and had become instead a comfortable craft by which to secure one's daily needs. And he concluded that section by saying this, the venture of being called close to the mystery of God requires a preparation like that of Moses, who heard words that still hold true. One must take off one's shoes in the encounter with the burning bush. And Rashtar said, this is first and foremost, taking off one's shoes, this is first and foremost removing the excess of all dead things, possessions, with which a man can surround himself, behaviors that oppose the paschal way of life, because only the one who loses himself will find himself. Now this participation in the Eucharist, as I said before, is not over even for the faithful. What Christ did on the cross was to establish a common bond of life between himself and the people. And this bond of life, this new covenant, demands a new mode of action from those who now enjoy the special fellowship with Christ our Lord. So we look to the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew's Gospel. We look to chapter 18 of Matthew's Gospel for Jesus' teaching on ambition, on scandal, on straying, on fraternal correction. We look to St. Paul's teaching on the role of the Spirit in our lives, and especially Paul's teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how these gifts add us, aid us in building up the community of faith so that together we become that living sacrifice of praise. And as a living sacrifice of praise, we are to become a sign of hope to those deprived of their freedom. We become a light to the blind who cannot contemplate the beauty of creation. We become an uplifting presence to those who are distressed and saddened, a sign of God's love for the poor who lack the means of subsistence. The pleas and the sufferings, the hopes and anxieties and expectations of so many demand that we put into practice Jesus' example. The world's disrespect for human life, the increase in moral permissiveness, the dwindling concern for truthful speech, the widespread desacralization and dehumanization taking place in our society demand that we do what Jesus told us to do in Mass, do this in memory of me. You have to think of that when the priest says, that, do this. What is he talk, what, what's the this? This self-giving love that I have given to you, do that now in your lives too. The body and blood received in Holy Communion 
is none other than the true body born of the Virgin Mary. There's a, you, you might all be familiar with the, the Latin hymn, Ave Verum Corpus, De Maria Virgine. It's the true body born of Mary. It was this body in which the Son was crucified, the body which gloriously arose and which will come again in the last day. So what we are to do, what are we to do, rather, in the presence of such a mystery? And the priest invites us to respond to his declaration, Mysterium Fidei, and we respond, at least in the old Latin, in the first uh, thing, at the first Eucharistic prayer, uh, it's, it's a little longer. I th for, what, what do we say? Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. But the, the, the old Latin says, Lord, we proclaim your death. We believe you rose from the dead, and we do this until you come again. All of which I think will be in the new translation. Now, I, I, just, I, I do want to say a little word about these hymns, but before I do, I want to tell you a little story about the experience that a Jesuit priest author, Father William Johnson, had. Uh, William Johnson had worked an awful long time with the Japanese, in the, the Catholic community over in Japan. And he had celebrated a mass at a conference of Christians and Buddhists. And one of the Buddhists, who was familiar with Catholic theology, attended the Mass. And afterward, he asked Father Johnson, why do you sing after communion? <coughs> and in response, Father Johnson jokingly said, well, it's something we picked up from the Protestants. <laughs> but the Buddha said, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Why sing together then of all times? Why act communally and use someone else's words, hear someone else's voices, when you have just been given God by God? He said, you've just been drawn into the deepest spousal moment of your life in Holy Communion. Sometimes, he said, such moments will erupt in song, but not often. He said, a better practice would be silence. Amen. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. <laughs> but it's a great thought. I mean, some people would object to that, but I mean, it was that the Buddhist had an insight into that. Now, uh, the... the these, these hymns, you have to make sure that you take these hymns to your parish and they use them once in a while. The O Sacrum Convivium, I mean, it's, it's, it's I, I already went over that with you. But it, it's, it's very difficult uh, to, do, 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 are many of you familiar with Cardinal Newman's um, <coughs> prayer, the Anima Christi? Do you, do you say it in Latin or do you say it in English? Yeah, well, his translation, the Anima Christi, it's a beautiful prayer in Latin, but his English translation is just numinesque, you know, if we could say it that way. Uh, for instance, when we, in the Latin, it's uh, uh, Anima Christi sanctifica me, corpus Christi salva me, uh, sanguis Christi inebriae me, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, blood of Christ inebriate me. But he says, blood of Christ, fill all my veins. Passion of Christ, my comfort be. Oh, good Jesus, listen to me. In thy wounds I fain would I, never to be parted from thy side. It's, it's a beautiful English translation of a real terse Latin hymn. We need someone like Newman to give us an English translation of the Adoro Te. Do we have any English scholars here? You should really uh, try to, we should try to get something because it's, it's very difficult to translate it. Um, the, uh, the, the, the image that I used before, the Pie Pelicane, Jesu Domine, 
that they cuius una stila, salvum facere, totum mundum credo, omni shelere, one single drop. Right? But in, in the first verse, he's saying, I, I, I adore you with all devotion, hidden deity, who under these elements lie hidden. Uh, my whole heart is subject to you. My whole being is subject to you. Because contemplating you, meditating on you, everything fails. And then he goes on to say, vision, visus, tactus, gustus, everything fails. But just hearing, I believe. I believe, credo, quid, quid, dixit, dei, filius. I believe what the Son of God said. Nothing is more true than his word. Right? Then he says, on the cross, only the deity lay hidden. In cruce lateba sola deitas. But here, in the Eucharist, also lies hidden his humanity. Right? Believing both and confessing both, I ask what the penitent thief asks. <coughs> Your wounds like Thomas I saw, plagas secret Thomas, Thomas non in, I do not see your wounds, non in two aor. But my God, I still confess, believe. Help me to believe more and more, to have faith in you, to love you, right? Then he talks about the memorial of the death of the Lord, the living bread, giving life to man. Help me to live by you and always to taste dulce sapere, then the pie pelicane. And Jesus, whom hidden now I perceive, oro fiat illud quotam sitio, I, I pray for that which I desire, ut te revelata, with, uh, that you revealed, uh, seeing you face to face, I may be blessed with the vision of your glory. Again, notice the future element. So those three elements are all there. Right? right in this thing. It's a beautiful hymn. Now, the final thing I just wanted to, you to look at is that th this is a, uh, there's nothing classical about this. This is not a translation of anything. There is a redeemer. But if, if, if you read it, through for a second, John is going to do the music of it in a second. But if, if you read it, what do you notice? What are the elements that we talked about tonight that you notice in this hymn? It's very popular amongst young people today. But what, what are the elements that we talked about that you notice here? Okay, the spirit is present. What else? The what? The Trinity. I can't hear you. The Trinity. Yeah, the Trinity is there. Good. The Trinity is there. The Trinity is there. The Thanksgiving is there. Right? The Father sending the Son. The Father sending the Spirit. Uh, the Lamb of God theme. Right. And notice, leaving your spirit with us until your work on earth is done, the anticipation of the future. All right. So I say it's, it's not the classic music that you would hear in the Adorate or the Osacrum Convivium or the Ave Verum Corpus. But since it's popular with a lot of young people, someone in the parish gave it to me. So John's going to now play the music of it to you uh, hear it. Number 10. <laughs> He's never good at these things, you know. Just let go. 
What do you think? Nice little song. Can I have my tape? Thank you for coming. <laughs>